Welcome back to Applied Mathematical Finance and its object-oriented implementation. And in our last session, we started doing some numerical um, experiments on our interest rate model on our big term structure model now. So, so the Monte Carlo simulation that allows us to simulate well, multiple forward rates, so a discretized interest rate curve. So that actually was our model. So we had an ETO stochastic process for individual forward rates driven by multiple Brownian motions. So our factors um, with functions here in front our factor loadings. So the functions could also depend on L. Then we had a load local uh, volatility function. And um, we introduced different numerators also being functions of that L. And our way to discretize this was uh, the Euler scheme, but we did not discretize um, L directly. So we discretized some state. So that was the state Y. So we performed here an Euler scheme for the state Y, where the relation between L and uh, Y is this state space transform. So here this function F, which we view as a part of the model. Um, our numerical experiments started with, say, a very simple model, a simple version of that, yeah, where I just use some, say, for example, constant uh, coefficients. So we had a simple model for the numerical test. And this simple model for the numerical test is created here in this model factory. So you see the method here has several arguments. So we can specify the measure, spot or terminal measure. We may specify an interpolation method for the simulation time that will be analyzed later. We can specify a single forward rate. So it's not um, a vector, it's a single one. So we have a flat forward rate curve, uh, the period length. Uh, we can specify if we use a separate discount curve and forward curve. Uh, that will be a topic today. And we can specify the covariance structure. Uh, that will be a topic later. And of course, uh, how many Brownian motions do we use? How many Monte Carlo sample paths do we use? So we already went through the code constructing this simple model. So for this session here, actually, the thing is that we use a log normal model. So we can use actually a blended model. So there's a parameter alpha here. Well, in that case, we also scale it with the initial value of the forward rate. So that part here would be the normal part. And then we have one minus alpha L I T. That part here would be the log normal part. So that alpha is here in the code. This parameter here, local volatility, normality plan. So how much normal do you have? If alpha becomes closer to one, yeah. so then that part here will dominate. And we just have a constant in front of the DW. So it will be a normal one. If alpha becomes closer to a zero, so then that part here will dominate and I have an LI DWI, so I have a log normal model. And of course, all this is still maybe multiplied 
with say some constant, uh, some constant sigma i, which is in our case um, the same for all for all forward rates, which is here this parameter volatility. So a single parameter volatility. Then all the forward rates come with an initial value and the initial value is also just a single initial value for all the forward rates, which is here this forward rate. Okay, so we have this uh, little toy model yeah, where we perform some simplifications. So a single parameter sigma here, a parameter that a single parameter that decides are we normal or log normal, a single parameter for the initial value, and also a single parameter that defines the correlation and so on. So that is here the code we just looked at, which creates this uh, model. So here is this forward rate curve the Li of zero that is identically to the L zero. My L zero is that quantity here. So this line of code will create a curve of such forward rates. Well, now the curve is flat. And then I have here um, another line of code where I can create a discount curve. So that one is calculating zero copper bond prices. Maybe also observed in zero from these forward rates. So it's calculating a zero copper bond curve. So maybe I should write the maturity maps to P of T and zero. So, and this curve is given by just using the forward rate one plus L times period length. Yeah, so there is a certain period length specified here to create bond prices at several times. And then there is some um, interpolation. Uh, specified. So you can also create these uh, two uh, two objects, the forward curve and the discount curve, which are now consistent. Yeah. So if you would calculate a forward rate from these bonds, yeah, you would actually just get this value. Um, then of course we have the time discretization, the time discretization of our simulation time. So this here is the little ti, my or little tj, yeah, the simulation time. Uh, so maybe maybe I use here j for the forward rates, and then I can use here i for the simulation time discretization. Um, then we specify our volatility, the sigma j of ti. Okay, that's just the constant volatility. So you see that it's just a constant. It's identically to our single parameter sigma star, yeah, which is this parameter here, the sigma star, or single parameter. Then we specify the correlation. So there's some correlation model. And then we put in front the factor, yeah, the local volatility factor that decides are we a normal model or are we a log normal model. So that part, yeah, maybe we are also move to indices being J. J for the tenor discretization, I for the simulation time discretization. So once we have that, we can specify the measure. So there is this, 
So there's a spot here where we specify the simulation measure, can be spot or terminal measure. So here, and then we put all the things together and call our method that finally creates here the model. So that's it. Now we have a nice little toy model to perform some uh, numerical approximations and some numerical experiments. We already did a numerical experiment in our last session where we looked here at the impact of choosing different measures on the valuation of the Theo Cooper bond price. So here we are creating our toy model using these parameters. And then for different maturities, so for different uh, payment times, we construct a zero Cooper bond and calculate with that model, the value of that zero Cooper bond. Now these simulation times are actually, or these uh, payment times here. So now these payment times here are actually part of my tenor discretization. So I can use the forward rates to calculate the bond price analytically. And the analytic value of the bond price is just the product one plus forward rate times period length to the power of minus one. Um, so I can calculate the analytic um, value and I can now compare these two values. But since these two values decay over time, it's maybe nicer to just check the interest rate associated with these bonds. So let's compare not the two values, let's compare the logarithm of the value divided by the maturity. Yeah? So the e to the minus rt, so then I compare the r. Uh, so that's just maybe a better, a better microscope yeah, to look at the error, uh, because um, if you have, for example, the same relative error, then the effect that the value is decreasing then leads to the effect that the absolute error becomes smaller, yeah? but actually the relative error stayed, stayed the same. Uh, so it's sometimes nice to factor out the, such effects. And here I would like to factor out the effect of increasing maturity and would like to look um, at the error uh, in terms of this yield. Yeah? So we compare these two. And uh, yeah, we could, could run this experiment and that was uh, where we had uh, to stop in the last session because we were out of time. And that was the result for the terminal measure. So the error is well, large here in the beginning, small in the end. And if we change here the measure, you can now look at this also for the spot measure. And you see, okay, the error looks a little bit more even constant, but it's small in the beginning and large in the end. So now I have prepared uh, this experiment here in this class. So, and I have also many more other experiments. So this guy is now, part of my repository FinMath experiments. Um, so, but I will also distribute the link later to this. And actually this here is just the same um, experiment. So I consider different measures, the terminal measure and the spot measure. Um, I construct the model, this is my simulation model. And then I consider the different maturities, I create the zero copper bond, I calculate the value of the zero copper bond, and then I compare this yield. Yeah, So the logarithm of the bond value divided by the maturity multiplied with minus one and minus in front here. Uh, so I can compare the Monte Carlo valuation and the analytic valuation 
for this yield parameter. Um, and I'm not printing this here. I'm adding it to a list. So a list of maturities and a list of errors. And then I can call a nice function that creates a plot of these values. So it will actually plot here in a scatter uh, for the X values, the maturities, and for the Y values, the um, errors. And then I can add a nice title here. So, um, so here, then I can add here a nice title to it, which also contains the measure that we have chosen. Yeah, and the measure is actually here in this loop. Yeah, this loop tells me loop over all combinations of this measure. Okay, and in this setup, maybe I can generate now more um, of these uh, plots and have a look at these. For example, I can also change some other parameters, like for example, here the discount curve. Uh, maybe we like to use that later. So currently this use discount curve parameter should be just a single one, namely false. So let's run now this little um, experiment. So I run this guy here. That should now create two plots, one plot for the terminal measure and one plot for the spot measure. Okay, so and now we see these two plots and you see that um, the behavior is similar to what we saw when we printed the result. So for the terminal measure, we have that the error is zero, almost zero here at the end. So the error here at the, at, at the high maturity times is small and then the error is actually increasing, but the error is also wiggling around a bit. And um, for the spot measure, we have actually the behavior that the error is small. So zero is here below. So the error is small, yeah, zero is here below for small maturities. Actually, there is also a small red dot here. So, uh, which is unfortunately due to the choice here of the scale uh, of the axis, uh, not so visible. Um, so actually the error is exactly zero at this point. And then we have some error that is a little bit smoothly accumulating. Okay, I would like to discuss this result a little bit uh, yeah, in more details. So what are we doing? Well, we are looking at the impact of the choice of the equivalent martingale measure on our approximation error. And that's maybe already a nice insight. So the choice of the equivalent martingale measure has an impact on the numerical error. So something which you may be not observe in um, yeah, other contexts in an equity model yeah, where the choice of the equivalent martingale measure is maybe quite clear. So here it has an impact on the numerical approximation error. And where do we um, observe this? Well, the choice of the equivalent Martin care measure changes the drift. So if we look at the equivalent martingale measure uh, for a different equivalent martingale measure, which means we choose a different numeraire, we have a different drift. And the Euler scheme will create an error in the drift, drift discretization. So our drift is a highly nonlinear thing. So, you know, there is a, it's a function of L. If we have a log normal model, there is, for example, L divided by one plus L times delta T in the drift. So the Euler scheme will lead to time discretization errors in the drift. Hence, if we have a different drift, we have different time discretization errors. Where can I see this error? So which financial product depends on this error? If you remember how we derived the form of the drift, well, the drift was derived from looking at zero copper bonds. And we had the property that 
the value of the zero copa bond divided by the numeraire, so the value of paying one unit divided by n, has to be a martingale under my model. So if we have a wrong drift, we should see wrong behavior in the zero copa bond prices. So an approximation error of the drift will result in an error of the valuation of the zero copper bond. So for that reason, we will value now zero copper bonds under different measures. What were our two different measures? Well, we also had um, a third one, the TK forward measure. Uh, we had the terminal measure where the where the numeraire is the zero copper bond that matures at maturity. And observe for the terminal measure that this means I look at the analytic value of the zero copper bond that matures at maturity observed in the time Ti. So that means given my simulated uh, quantities. So, and the value of that uh, zero copper bond observed in TI is just the product of one plus L observed in TI for the period from TK to TK plus one, two multiplied with that period length to the power of minus one, and then the product over all these guys. Yeah, so you remember that this here is just, We are currently here, and this here is our terminal time. And then we just look at all the forward rates for these periods to calculate the value of that zero copper bond, given that we are in this time. Uh, one important thing that you observe is that the time here is always changing. Yeah? Uh, over the full period. So every guy here is getting um, some random movement yeah, if time moves closer to the final time. So that's something that we observe. We derive then the drift and the drift is similar here to this product. So the product comes from I, the time where I am, to the uh, final time. The drift is also running here over all rates from J. So that's the drift of the J's rate, the rate which I'm looking at, to the final time. So you see that the drift for each of these forward rates, so for example, this here is the rate LJ, the drift is then going over these interest rates up to the final time. So maybe I do that guy here in green. This is J plus one to the, the final time. So that's actually the drift for this forward rate here, right? So you see I taking fewer and fewer rates and the drift is becoming a sum also over fewer and fewer correlation terms that has fewer and fewer nonlinear functions of the forward rates. So from that view, it's actually obvious that the error in the drift should become smaller as the time Ti of my zero bond. So this is where actually I'm looking at the numeraire. So I'm looking here at the numeraire N of Ti um, is approaching the final time. So my guess is that the error in the drift should become smaller as J approaches N minus one. So that means if we look here at the zero bond, the error in these guys here
as Ti approaches Tn. Okay, and now we have a nice intuition why we see this behavior. So let me draw here where the error is zero. That's the line where the error is zero. And we see the error is small for zero Cooper bonds that mature far in the future. Actually for Ti equals Tn, the error is zero because then my numerea is equal to one and calculating the expectation of one, even if we use a Monte Carlo simulation is just one. Yeah? So there is no error, but if you stay away from Tn, uh, there's not only the um, time discretization error in the drift, there's also the Monte Carlo error because we have samples, we just use a finite number of samples. So we do not have the true distribution. So there could still be uh, the Monte Carlo error um, here. Um, and you also see this behavior that we have some noise in the error. So the error is not something which accumulates in a very continuous way. Uh, the error is jumping around. And why is that? Okay, the reason for that is because here we use a different time yeah, for each zero copper bond. So each of these guys has moved a little bit randomly if you choose a little time. So, and that random change is a random change in the error. So we see that we can understand the specific behavior here of the error under the terminal measure. So how does it look for the spot measure? So if we move to the spot measure, our numerea is here the accrual account that accrues one unit. So we initially start with n of t0 equal to one, yeah? and then we accrue one unit of currency. So we invest it always in the next zero copper bond. So we gain the interest um, here over each period up to time ti by accumulating the interest. And one effect that you observe is that the next numerea is the previous numerea multiplied with one plus L i minus one, T i minus one, delta T i minus one. So um, it's just a small additional modification of the previous numerea where we just use here once a single forward rate for a small period uh, at a new time. So in contrast to what you had here, each forward rate uses here the time TK, so it's specific fixing time, and there's not so much random change. So there's not so much random change if we move to the next numerator. So that aspect of the noise here is maybe smaller for the spot measure. We will look at the picture uh, next, but first let me look at the drift. So the drift is now here running from the current time to the um, forward rate that I'm observing. So if we draw this little picture, so now everything is not going from TI is the maturity of my zero copper bond, which I'm observing. So that's the 
maturity of the zero copper bond I'm observing. So I'm I'm looking at what is the numerea in Ti. So now it's not related to what happens at later times. It's happened or what happened at that time. It's related to what happened before. Yeah? Why? Because you see that here in the definition of the numerea, the numerea is constructing by multiplying the forward rates from the beginning to that point. So the numerea is becoming more and more complex and getting more and more stochastic terms as we move to larger maturities in the numerea. And then for each of these guys here, so if we, if we have here a forward rate L, K, yeah, that is part of the numerea. Then the drift of this forward rate is, well, running from time zero to its fixing time. Uh, so there is some time running through that. So maybe here there is little t. Yeah. So that's the remaining drift of this rate. And we have in the drift then the covariance of these rates that are before this rate. Yeah? So um, this part uh, becomes uh, smaller as the drift is integrated. So it is um, yeah, a little bit uh, more uh, balanced. Yeah? So this guy here gets larger, but at the same time, uh, also my little t is integrating. Yeah? So it's a kind of a triangle of uh, uh, yeah, covariance that e enters in, 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 in this calculation. Uh, so we expect two effects. So this noisy part should be smaller yeah, because we only use a single one that is new and the error should increase over time because the error is smaller if the maturity is closer to today. Yeah, yeah okay, so let's have a look at uh, the corresponding picture that was created. So we see that's here our picture and as I mentioned, uh, there is also here a little spot at, at the first period. So why is that? Okay, the error at the first period is zero. Let me draw the line where the error is zero. Okay, if you look at the numerator, you see that for the first time T1, this here will run from k equals zero. So this will be t zero. So there the forward rate is just the initial value. It's not stochastic. Yeah? And I actually do not even need a drift yeah? because I need the value of the forward rate in t zero. So the drift is not integrated. I need a forward rate. So this integral here is missing. I need the forward rate in t zero. So it will be deterministic. So the spot measure has a deterministic numerator at the starting point. The terminal measure has a deterministic numerator at the final end point. So I have zero error here in the beginning. And then we see that really the error somehow smoothly accumulates. Yeah? So this noisy effect is not there. Of course, there is some, uh, yeah, sometimes it moves down, sometimes it moves up. Yeah? So there is some maybe randomness in this, but um, the uh, error um, accumulates and the error is large here at the end. So the error accumulates um, over time. So that's the one for the spot measure. Yeah, maybe one last remark. If you look here at the scales, so this error goes here up to 10 to the minus four, two times 10 to the minus four. But for the terminal measure, we have that the error is yeah, maybe in the range of five times 10 to the minus four, or even 
one times 10 to the minus three. Yeah? So it appears to be five times or 10 times larger uh, in a different region, yeah? but over the whole uh, maturities here of 20 years, yeah? we have this um, uh, effect. And why is that? Yeah, so if we go back to the formulas, you see that if you are, say, at a very early time, so in T1, in T2, in T3, yeah, then you have here a very large product, product over all these forward rates, where each such forward rate has a very large term in the drift. Yeah? It is because this blue part here is very long, but also for each forward rate, the green part, yeah? so the terms in the drift, is very large. For the spot measure, this effect is a little bit uh, smaller because you see um, for the spot measure, the points that have large errors are the ones that are far in the future. So where this guy becomes large, the product of these uh, interest rates becomes large. We have many interest rates in uh, uh, creating the numeria, but um, you see that we used forward rates that were already fixed. So the guy that has accumulated more error is just a single one and not many ones. Yeah? So there is a, is a different one, a di difference here. And then you see that the way error is accumulated over time, so this green part here is decreasing. Yeah? So I'm only accumulating for a small amount of uh, factors in this product, I'm just accumulating a small additional um, amount. Uh, so from that aspect, the error accumulation in the spot measure is, well, really much smaller. So you see that there is a big difference in uh, choosing the numeria, choosing the measure with respect to the numerical error. And sometimes it may decide uh, which, uh, which ap application do you have? Yeah, are you only interested in what happens at the final time? Then maybe terminal measure is the best measure. Uh, are you interested in what happens over the whole time? Yeah, then maybe spot measure is the better one. So now uh, I would like to show you a nice uh, little trick that allows us to actually remove this error uh, completely. And uh, those who have followed the numerical method lectures, maybe uh, yeah, recall the trick of a control variant. And what we do here is a little bit similar. It's actually simpler uh, to a control variant. Maybe I go back to that uh, session yeah, where control variants were integrated. Actually, it was Monte Carlo control variants. The trick of a control variant is that if you do not know the analytic value for actually the random variable of interest, but you know the analytic value of a similar random variable, then maybe subtracting the error of that random variable will also improve the expectation of the other random variable because there is a high correlation of the two objects. So for um, Monte Carlo simulation, the trick is actually that you have an object that is of interest to you. You have another object, say Y, for which you know the analytic value, and then you subtract just the error of that other object. Hopefully this increase improves then the um, uh, error in the object of interest. 
And if you look at this equation here, actually, if you choose C equals to one and Y equals to X. So if you know the analytic solution of the expectation of X, then you can just replace the random variable by X minus X plus mu, uh, which would give you the um, true solution. And what we will do now is just that. So don't be confused if you do not remember the thing with the control variant, it's not so important. The trick that we will do is very simple, but for those who remember that, just a reminder, it's, it's a bit similar and maybe a special case. So my claim was I can actually apply a trick and remove this error here completely. So the situation is that I do know the analytic zero copper bond price that I would like to observe. So let P superscript zero yeah, or circle denote the analytic zero copper bond price that we would like to match by our numerical valuation. So that's the um, analytic value I could calculate from my discount curve using the initial values of my forward rate curve. And then I can check the numerical calculation. Yeah? So let P star denote the zero copper bond value that is achieved by my numerical valuation. So if you go back to the code, this is our little experiment. This is the P zero, the analytic value of the zero copper bond that I would like to have. And this is the P star, the numerical calculation of the zero copper bond that I'm looking at. So I, I know these two values uh, and I especially know the analytic value from the um, model parameters from the initial value of the model. Then I can introduce an adjusted numeraire by applying the following adjustment. So this here is an adjustment to the numeraire. I take the numeraire that is created by my numerical method. So this is the product of one plus L times period length. Yeah? So to the power of minus one, if you're in terminal measure or not to the power of one, minus one, if you're in spot measure, this is this object that we calculate numerically. So this is my numerical numeraire. And then I'm multiplying it with the ratio of the numerical calculation of the zero copper bond and the analytic calculation of the zero copper bond. So I'm multiplying it with this adjustment here. So what happens? Yeah, so actually, if I now value um, a zero copper bond using this adjusted numeraire, so this guy here is now my adjusted numeraire, Then I get exactly the analytic value of the zero copper bond. So maybe I should just use this numeraire, which has a small adjustment that removes all numerical errors. Uh, let's uh, check this. Um, so I would like to value this. Of course, I would like to value it ana uh, not analytically. I would like to value it numerically. So uh, note that here I have the numerical calculation. Yeah? So this E hat is now here my expectation operator, uh, not in the mathematical sense, in the computer implementation sense. Yeah? So over my finite sample space. Yeah? So this error correction will not only remove all the time discretization errors, it will also remove the Monte Carlo errors and whatever on zero copper bond prices.
So if I perform this calculation, uh, then yeah, I would like to value a zero copper bond. Uh, valuing a zero copper bond is one divided by the numerea at maturity, taking the expectation multiplied with the numerea at evaluation time. Uh, so evaluation time is here the T zero. Uh, so I calculate here the value of N at T zero divided by in at capital T. And now I use my adjusted numerea. So the N superscript zero, the one that we have calculated or defined here. So if I plug this definition in, then this is calculating with the unadjusted numerea. So this is like calculating with the numerea that we had used before. And multiplying with this um, adjustment. Uh, so this adjustment is, by the way, a deterministic number. Yeah? Well, because uh, the P star is the numerical valuation. Yeah? So the P star is actually just value a zero copper bond with your numerical algorithm. Yeah? So take the expectation of one divided by n star of capital T. Yeah? So this guy is FT zero measurable if you would like to write this a bit more fancy. Yeah? So this whole object here is uh, FT zero measurable. It's a deterministic factor, just a multiplicative factor, but it depends on uh, maturity. Yeah? It depends on time. Yeah? So every numerator gets, gets a different such factor. So you see that then um, what we do is very simple. We just divide the numerical calculation by the value of the numerical calculation. Uh, so which is then a one. So that guy here cancels. And we multiply with the stuff that we would like to have, uh, the analytic valuation. So we multiply with the P zero, superscript zero, and we get the right result. Okay, that really looks brutal. Yeah? I mean, I completely remove the full numerical valuation and get the right result. Uh, okay, so it's... Um, um, a brutal way of fixing any numerical error. And you really have to be careful if you do something like that, because um, it will make the error invisible, but maybe some other quantities can get a larger error through this, and you do not see this immediately. Yeah? So we have to actually check, does this alter the forward rates? Does this alter the value of caplets? How does it alter these financial products? And we will see in a few uh, minutes that this is a harmless uh, uh, correction. Yeah? Although it looks at this point very brutal, but we can do this. Um, if you would like to understand what's happening here uh, and how it maybe relates to the control variate, um, maybe this view is a bit nice. So if you look not what's happening on the numerea, if you look what is happening on the logarithm of the numerea. So we, we take here log of n. So I have the logarithm of my numerically calculated numerea and I have the logarithm of my adjusted numerea. Then you see that they are adjusted by subtracting the logarithm of one divided by P star or plus logarithm of P star and um, adding the logarithm of one divided by P zero. So the analytic value, the target value yeah, or minus logarithm of P zero. Huh? Um, so you see that you have this kind of um, adjustment here. Yeah, and you see that it's like a control variate uh, from some random variable. Yeah, I'm subtracting the uh, analytic error here and adding the um, 
analytic uh, target value. Um, if you now differentiate this with respect to maturity, so let's apply D by D capital T. Okay. Um, then if you interpret your numerea, yeah, then if you assume that your numerea would be just a dn is rn dt, which is the case for our model, yeah, because um, the new numerea is just the previous numerea multiplied with one plus l. So actually the r is uh, related to this one plus l. Um, so it's the growth rate. Yeah? So r is just the uh, log drift or the drift of the logarithm of the numeria. Then if you now differentiate the uh, definition on the top, uh, which is maybe the definition of the n, the adjusted numeria, then you see that this is just a deterministic drift adjustment for the numeria. Yeah? So R is the drift of the numeria, the log drift of the numeria. And you see, we just adjust by the difference in where should the zero Cooper bond go and where is the zero Cooper bond uh, gone. Okay, that's going on. If we perform this little correction here, this adjustment of the numeria. And maybe some of you have already spotted that we have this in the code and the code is activating this if we provide a so-called discount curve. So this P is zero in the code corresponds to providing an object for this parameter discount curve. So let me shortly look at the code. We have here this uh, simulation model and there was a parameter here, US discount curve in our model factory. So if I go back to the model factory, there is here this Boolean US discount curve. And if that is true, he will create a discount curve. Well, actually he will create a discount curve that is consistent to my forward rate curve. So he will create, he will calculate the zero copper bond price, the analytic zero copper bond prices by just um, multiplying one plus forward rate times period length to the power of minus one. Um, so he will calculate this P zero. So this object here is just the calculation of these zero copper bonds. And then if this object is not null, so this object is then passed here to my LIBOR market model, to my term structure model as this argument. And now let's look what is, what is done with this in the implementation of this guy. So you see there's here this parameter discount curve, which is also stored in a field called discount curve. Yeah? So there is a field here, discount curve in the class. Where is this discount curve now used? Okay, it's used in, okay, that's not the place here. Uh, let's, let's move to the definition of the class and check the methods. It's used in the calculation of the numeria. So here's the definition of this class and we can now look at all the methods and there is the calculation of the numerea. And now you see that there is a numerea unadjusted, which is just the native product of all these one plus L's. And then there is just um, a get uh, numerea here, which then looks like that. Okay, so you see, we call the method that calculates this unadjusted numeria. So this is my n star. And then I'm looking if I have some discount curve, I perform this adjustment.
Okay, so if we look at the code, so here I calculate the unadjusted number rare n of t. This here is the little t, and this little function here get number rare defaultable zero copper bond. The name defaultable will be clear in a few minutes, okay, because that's some possible application to introduce default here. That is my n zero of t. So this guy was the n star. Then from the n star, I'm calculating, ah, sorry, this is the uh, p zero, right? Okay, yeah, this is the p zero. So this guy here is the p zero, so the analytic zero copper bond. Um, uh, then I'm calculating the P star. So this guy here was the N star, taking the inverse of the N star expectation of one divided by N star uh, is the P star of capital T. Well, actually P star of capital T divided by N star of T zero. So that does not Meta. Okay, so now I used capital T. I should use capital T here, and that's the capital T then. Um, yeah, and then um, I'm uh, multiplying this guy with the unadjusted. So there is the expectation of this, which is the P star, yeah, so this is the expectation of this. And then I'm multiplying this with the adjustment. Okay, so you see there is the, this uh, small correction in the, in the code that, that does this. Okay, so let's go back to our little experiment. And if I now go back to my, if I now go back here to my experiment and I now allow also that they calculate this um, discount curve and we now run our little experiment again. Now I have both cases use discount curve false and true and both cases use terminal measure and spot measure. And now we get all the four cases on the left-hand side, the terminal measure, on the right-hand side, the spot measure on the top with the, uh, without the discount curve correction and on the bottom with the discount curve correction. So we see the error is actually gone. Um, a small remark, we can use this uh, trick yeah, also to create actually a model that models two different curves. So in this case, I just had the application, I want to remove the error, but it could be that we just use a completely different discount curve for this uh, in this trick. And there's also, well, um, um, from the modeling um, perspective, uh, a meaning behind this using a completely different curve. But before I do this, let's uh, look at the approximation error of the forward rates. And the reason I would like to look at this in addition is the following question. Does this brutal correction of the error of the numeraire actually be, is, is it harmful or does it affect, so does this affect um, the approximation errors of the forward rates. So for example, because sometimes it can be that you do something good in one place, which creates something bad in another place. And it's really important to check how such corrections affect your, your model. So for that reason, let's look at the different quantity. So I look now at the approximation error on the forward rates. So I do know that, paying the forward rate L 
times the period length, if you like, though that's just um, a scaling factor, but paying this at time t i plus one. So this here is the payment time. So if I pay this at this time, then I know an analytic value for this. I know an analytic valuation. You could now say, okay, if you choose the bond that matures at payment time, then this guy is a martingale. So you know that the value of this is just the value of the forward rate observed at evaluation time. So this here is evaluation time multiplied with the numeraire at evaluation time, but the numeraire at evaluation time is your zero copper bond that matures at the payment time. Uh, yeah, okay, so we know an analytic value of this. It's the forward rate observed at evaluation time multiplied with the period length because the period length appears here um, as a scaling factor. So it should also appear here, uh, multiplied with uh, the numeraire at the payment time. So I can check this and here we perform the numerical valuation. So this here is the E hat, yeah, my expectation operator in the sense of my numerical uh, valuation. So we get some errors for the terminal measure and the spot measure. So I prepared this um, experiment already. So it's the second one in my list of experiments. So maybe we can make this guy smaller here. So there's a test forward rate under different measures. So you see, it's very similar. We have the same parameters for our model, constant forward rate, period length, volatility, log normal model, uh, no um, correlation parameters. So correlation is one, no correlation decay. So there is um, two different measures. And also the question, what happens if we change the uh, discount curve? So if we apply this correction to the bonds. So the only difference is that now I'm looking at different fixings of the forward rates. So I have different, uh, yeah, okay. Now I also call it maturities. Maybe I should relabel this because now it's actually the fixing. Okay, so I look at different fixings of the forward rate and I'm valuing the product that pays the forward rate. So if you look here in this definition of this financial product, it's just asking the model for the forward rate. It's multiplying this forward rate with the period length and then it's dividing by the numeraire, and that's it. Okay, so nothing special is happening here. We value this product here. Uh, and I would like to see the L. So I'm also dividing by the bond value. Okay, so I'm dividing by the bond value. So I would like to see the L. So I divide here by this value. So the remaining part should be L times period length. So I know the analytic value, the analytic value should be forward rate times period length. And then I compare the two, two errors and create this plot. Uh, note that I divide here by the bond value, but the bond is also calculated uh, numerically. You could also do the alternative line, which is here, where you, where you divide by the analytic bond value, but I'm not doing that. Yeah, let me first run this and then discuss the result. So now we see again on the top without the error correction, on the bottom with the error correction, left terminal measure, right spot measure. Yeah? So it is like that. Okay, so what you observe is the measure makes again a difference to the numerical error in the forward rate. This is clear to us now because there is a change in the drift and um, 
the drift is affecting the time discretization error of the forward rate. So I would expect this. Um, we see, however, that our error correction on the bond price does not make any difference to the error in the forward rate, which is for me a good news yeah, because it, it did not destroy anything for the forward rates. So let us first discuss the pictures a little bit. So this is without the error correction, the, or the error correction doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter as we have observed. This is the error for the terminal measure. So here we have terminal measure. Um, the error is small in the beginning, which is because my drift yeah, is accumulating errors. Yeah? So now I'm, I'm integrating the drift. So it's clear that the error is small in the beginning and then it increases. We also see this effect that there appears to be noise in the error. It's not so systematic, but also the error is small for large maturities, which is clear because under terminal measure, L19 is a martingale. Yeah? So here, this is terminal measure T20, L19, or actually it's semi-annual, it's L19.5 is a martingale. So if L19.5 is a martingale, then this means that um, this guy, so it's actually that guy here, the L19.5, this guy has no drift, drift is zero. So there's no discretization error in the drift. But you still see that it looks a little bit, there is a small error. Yeah, it's a little bit below zero, I believe. Huh? I don't know. I don't know. Um, there could be still an error here, which is of course a Monte Carlo error in the um, simulation of this random variable. Yeah. For the spot measure, yeah, we have a similar thing. Yeah. Error is small at the beginning, but the error is also a little bit systematically increasing. So it's large at the end. Yeah, the drift uh, error is accumulating. No forward rate is becoming a martingale at the end. They all were non-martingales in between. Uh, we observe, however, that we also have the effect that the range of the error is overall here smaller than here. So very similar behavior to uh, the bond, co so bond prices for the drift error. So what is now the impact of our correction, of our numeraire correction on these forward rates? Yeah. So what happens if we apply our correction control variates? It could happen that this affects or destroys the valuation of the floater or of the forward rate agreement. Yeah? That's important uh, to check. Well, it's easy to see that this does not affect the valuation. If you define your numerically calculated forward rate, yeah? so that here is L star. If I define this numerically forward rate, cal uh, numerically calculated forward rate as value paying the forward under my given numeraire. Divided by the zero copper bond under my given numeraire. Okay, so that's here the numeraire that I use in my implementation. Um, that is how I would numerically calculate this. Then I would like to see what happens if I now apply my adjustment. So that here was my uh, adjusted numeraire to this valuation. Okay, so just plug this in. Yeah? So I have here my adjustment. 
which I apply to my unadjusted numeraire. Yeah, you can move this adjustment outside of the expectation because it is a deterministic factor. Then you see that this here is your numerical calculation of the forward rate multiplied with your numerical zero Cooper bond multiplied with the adjustment factor. So what you see is that I get my numerically calculated forward bond, uh, forward rate, sorry, my numerical calculated forward rate. And I just cancel here the zero Cooper bond factor and multiply that guy with the P zero. So that's um, a nice result. So you see that you just correct the discounting also for this stochastic quantity. Yeah? You, you just correct the numeraire, uh, but you do not correct the forward rate. Um, the result is by the way different if you view not um, L star as the forward rate calculated, the forward rate payment calculated numerically divided by the zero Cooper bond calculated numerically. Uh, but instead, if you divide here with the P zero by the analytic value, okay, then you would actually see that the correction introduces an additional error on this quantity. Yeah, but this quantity is a little bit inconsistent. Yeah, it's mixed. Yeah, it's mixing numerical calculation with uh, analytic calculation. Um, so these are just the two additional pictures in the script that um, there is no difference in the error. And what I already mentioned is that we can use this trick to model a separate discount curve and forward rate for some financial applications. Uh, financial applications, which are counterparty default risk or collateralization. So it actually means sense to use, uh, it actually made it makes sense to use a different discount curve that not only corrects for a numerical error that also corrects for well, a, a modeling aspect uh, that introduces a modeling aspect into the model. We will discuss this then in the next session. Yeah, it is then the, a multi-curve model that we create with a very simple trick. And to conclude, let me just show you that last remark here in the code. So in the code, if I would calculate the value of my un, a numerical calculated forward rate here by taking the payment of L divided by the analytic zero copper bond. So I remove that line, sorry. So I remove that line and I add that the other line. Yeah? So it, this is the red part from the script. And if I run the program now, then you see that on the top without my control or my correction on the numeraire, on the bottom with the correction of the numeraire. And you see that it increases a little bit the error. Yeah? So you see there's a minus three times 10 to the minus three here. Here it's a minus two times 10 to the minus three. Yeah? So it has increased, uh, oh no, there it has decreased. Yeah, but here it's, it's, uh, it's uh, significant. Okay, so it changes. <laughs> so, so then you see now it changes the numerical error on the um, forward rate, yeah? if you interpret the forward rate that way. And for example, here you see it increases 
the numerical error and it also increases it uh, significantly yeah so this here is the spot measure it goes up to two or one times 10 to the minus four here yeah um, two times 10 to the minus four here it goes up to three times 10 to the minus four but this is a little bit because we are comparing the wrong values okay so that was it for today thank you and see you next time.